Have you ever heard someone say this? Maybe you've been at the Capitol, you've been talking with legislators, maybe you've been talking with pastors, maybe you've been talking with your friends. And people like to make other people happy. They like to get along. And so they say, some of my friends are for abolition, and some of my friends are for incrementalism, and I'm with my friends. I agree with my friends. And the way that they put this a lot of times is they say, uh, let's just run all the plays. Let's run all the plays. Let's run abolition. Let's run what the pro-life lobby has been doing. Let's run all the plays like it's a, like it's a football game. A lot of times they'll even use it like it's a football game. So let's just keep, you can keep throwing your Hail Marys. You're trying to throw it all the way to the end zone. But along the way, let's, let's just get a few yards of time with the pro-life thing, with the pro-life lobby strategy. Let's just do that. Let's just run all the plays. Well, I've heard that. I've heard that from all of those places. Um, and they say that that's what abolition is like. It's like throwing for the end zone every time. So we should do both incrementalism and abolition, they say. We should run all the plays. Well, of course, analogies break down. In football, there are no children dying in the end zone, right? In football, it is not possible to run different plays at the same time. There's one ball. You can run complicated plays, but it's still one play. And unlike football, this is not a game. This is war really and there are casualties every day in this war that we may not see or hear but they they are being slain but even though their the analogy certainly breaks down i want to go with it a little bit this evening to a point we're going to consider the football analogy this evening we're gonna consider this concept of running all the plays. And using the football analogy, I'm going to demonstrate or try to demonstrate four things. Number one is that both abolition and the strategy of the pro-life lobby are both about getting as many yards as we can, even if it's only a few at a time. We're not just chunking the ball for the end zone every single time. But we do it differently, obviously. Uh, number two, I want to show you that abolitionists and the pro-life lobby have very different end zones. We have very different goals. Number three, I want to show you that even if in pursuit of its own end zone, the pro-life lobby's playbook is losing yards, as we already saw on the last talk. Finally, the biggest thing that I want to show you this, this evening is that, although the fact we have different end zones is a huge difference that we'll talk about, it's not the biggest difference, I believe. The biggest difference is not the different end zones, the specific plays we run, or about how many yards we're trying to get at a time, and it's this biggest difference that I'm gonna leave you hanging that makes abolition and incrementalism completely incompatible. And I'm gonna come back to that. But most of all, I, that's what I wanna show you. And that is that you cannot run all the plays. You cannot be both for abolition and for incrementalism. You cannot be both for abolition and for the pro-life lobby's strategy for their playbook that we saw earlier. You cannot run all the plays because supporting one is opposing the other. So first, both abolition and incrementalism, the pro-life lobby's playbook, and they use that term, incrementalism, is we're both about getting as many yards as we can. Getting as many yards as God will allow us at a time, even if it is just a few. But the incrementalism of the pro-life lobby tries to get as many yards as it can, even if it's just a few, by chipping away at the, at the who, what, when, where, why, how of abortion around the edges 
restricting who commits abortion, what they use to commit it, when they commit it, where they commit it, why they commit it, and how they commit it. Abolitionism doesn't do that. We don't do that. Now, we are getting a few yards at a time, but it's by getting more and more people and more and more institutions on board with abolition, on the team, on the abolition team, if you will, about changing hearts and minds, which we're all, everyone is, wants to do that. But we want to change hearts and minds with the gospel of Jesus Christ because he is the one who has every heart of every citizen and voter and legislator and person and pastor in the land and Supreme Court justice. He's the one who has and holds their hearts in his hand. We want to change hearts and minds through the gospel, through repentance. But we also want to take a, however many yards we can get at a time geographically, whether it be cities for abolition, counties for abolition, Republican parties for abolition, states for abolition, countries for abolition. But I want worldwide abolition is what I want. But I'll take a city. I'll take a city at a time. However many yards at a time God chooses to give us, I'll take it. And that's what I want. So we're all for getting as many yards at a time as we can, but we have different approaches about how we do that. We also have very different end zones. Now, we're not on opposite end zones, right? It's not that they want abortion, we don't want abortion. That's not, it's not like that. There are many well-meaning pro-life lobbyists, people in the pro-life organizations, in the movement, who really do want to end at least most abortions. So we don't have completely opposite end zones, but we do have very different end zones. We're not running in opposite directions, but we're very different. The end zone or goal of the pro-life lobby has been to stop abortionists or abortion doctors from committing abortions that's it. While still allowing mothers to commit abortions. In fact, that's explicitly written into almost every single pro-life bill. Go look at the pro-life bills in your state. Go look at the pro-life laws in your state. I can pretty much guarantee you what almost all of them are going to say, and that is no partial birth abortion this doesn't apply to the mother. No dismemberment abortion, this doesn't apply to the mother. No um, you know, infant, uh, post-abortion infant protection act. I don't know how, but that doesn't apply to the mother. I, I saw a bill, we have a bill in Texas that says that. I'm like, how can that not apply to the mother? Like that's after the baby was already born. Somehow, somehow, that's what's written into almost every single bill of the pro-life lobby. We have a very different end zone uh, for abolition. The end zone of abolition, at least with regard to the issue of abortion, is equal protection. Equal protection by making abortion illegal for everyone. Because no one should have a license to kill an innocent preborn child. Because if abortion is wrong for anyone, it should be wrong for everyone across the board. So we have very different end zones, and that's why sometimes the pro-life movement will oppose us. It's like, you're going for the wrong end zone. The pro playbook of the pro-life lobby is losing yards. That's continuing with the football analogy. For the last 45 years, as we saw earlier, the pro-life lobby has been on the football field, and they've had a playbook, and we saw what those plays were. And as we discussed in our last talk, that playbook looks like this. Play number one, elect Republican presidents to appoint pro-life justices to overturn Roe while passing incremental legislation to undermine Roe, save some babies, and weaken the pro-abortion movement. And we already saw that it's been 47 years of failure running the playbook of the pro-life lobby. If you were not here for that talk, you can watch it on YouTube later. It's going to be entitled something like 47 Years of False Hope, Abortion in the Supreme Court. I encourage you to go watch that if you, if you, uh, if you weren't here for that. So coming back to football, is the pro playbook of the pro-life lobby gaining yards or is it actually losing yards? Well, we already looked at that. But here's what I really most want to get to. 
And that is the biggest difference about you know, using the football analogy, the biggest difference between abolitionism and incrementalism. And it really, again, we have different end zones, we're going about getting yards differently, we run different plays, but the biggest difference isn't about any of those things. It's about two things. It's about how we view the rules of the game. Continue the football analogy. Obviously, this is not a game, but you know what, you know what I'm saying. Go with me. It's about the rules, and it's about the referees. It's about the rules and the referees. Who here has ever played a game with written rules? Played a game that has written rules. And if you didn't, if you were playing a game and you didn't know it had written rules, I'm sure you found out once you violated one of them and someone said, well, let me, hey, there's actually rules about ping pong. It's right here. You know, someone will show you the rule as soon as you violate it. There's rules about pitching washers or horseshoes and there's, it's written all over the place. So we've all played games with written rules. Card games, Monopoly, board games, ping pong, tennis, softball, soccer. How would you react if every time you started winning at a game, a referee stepped in? In fact, maybe you're not even playing a game that even has referees, okay? But a referee stepped in and said, no, I'm going to take all your points and I'm going to give them to the other side. Or you've got to go back to the beginning of the board. Or in the case of the football analogy, you've got to go back to the one yard line. How would you feel about that if, it did, if they were breaking the rules to do it? They just did this on a whim. There's no rule that allowed them to do that. In fact, the rule said the exact opposite of what they were doing. How would you feel about that? But they're doing it anyway. And they're claiming to have authority. You'd be pretty upset by that, wouldn't you? You would be livid. Have you ever gotten mad over a game? Who here has gotten mad over a game? Sometimes we can get the most angry over the most trivial things. Sometimes literally trivial things if you're playing Trivial Pursuit. <laughs> Monopoly. Oh boy, I know, I know couples that they cannot play Monopoly together, okay? Because they get so upset. If only we got that angry. <laughs> about this issue, that upset about this issue, when someone stepped in and, and acted like they had authority. You'd be pretty upset. In fact, as it kept happening, if you were playing a team game, your team would probably start losing players very quickly because people would just get fed up with the game, get fed up with the whole system and just walk off the field if that's how the referees were acting. Okay, this is the difference between abolition and the strategy of the pro-life movement for the last 50 years. Because the referees, in this analogy, are, are the Supreme Court justices and the federal ju court, court judges. The referees are the Supreme Court justices and the federal court judges in this analogy. And when the pro-life lobby is marching down the field, gaining a few yards at a time, maybe by ways that they're compromising on. Whenever the referee breaks the rules and makes them go back to the one yard line, what has the pro-life lobby done? Has they, have they stood up and said, uh, no, that's not what the rules say. They said, oh, okay, I guess we gotta go back to the one yard line. That's not what the rules say, and the rule doesn't say you can even do this. But I guess we have to do it. That's what they've done. Between 2011 and 2016, the pro-life lobby introduced 334 bills across the country in a five-year period. And I can tell you what happened to most of those that passed. The referees came in and said, nope, we can't do that. And what did we do? What did they do? Okay, I guess we'll go back to the one yard line then. When they do, they can never get to the end zone because referees keep breaking the rules and sending them back to the one yard line or giving a safety. And I can't do that. Safety. 
Okay, for those of you that know football. I used to be a referee, actually. They give them a safety and give points to the other team. In fact, this gotten so bad that the pro-life lobby team doesn't, many of them, or almost all of them, they don't even look at the rule book anymore to know what they can and can't do. They don't even look at the rule book. They just go to the referees and say, can we do this? Are we allowed to do this? They just go to the referees and ask them. And most of the time the referees say, no, can't do it. Meanwhile, more and more of the pro-life team are just walking off the field because they're just fed up. And they're quitting the team. They thought they were going to actually end abortion. And every, but every time they make some progress, they got to go back to square one because these people over here are violating the rules and we're letting them get away with that? I'm not interested in that game. I am not interested in that. Or the players that stay... They're just half-hearted. They're just apathetic. Okay, I guess I need to be fighting against abortion. Let's uh, oh, gain a few yards. Okay, go back. Whatever. Or some of the worst ones are the ones who get Stockholm Syndrome. They love the referees. They become best friends with them. And when you righteously get upset with the referees, they're the ones defending them. They're the ones defending them. When the whole stadium is in an uproar about these referees and them violating the rules, they're the ones that are saying, hey, 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 no. They're the ones that should be denouncing them, but they're telling the crowd, hey, hey, calm down. Calm down. Respect the tyrants. I mean, I mean the refs. Okay. How excited would you get about playing a game where the rules were constantly changing and almost never in your favor? You would not be playing that game very long. I'm done playing that game. I'm done playing that game. When the referees break the rules and order the team back to the one yard line, the pro-life lobby team has just willingly complied. But when they do so, they're just continuing to legitimize the tyranny of the referees. I was actually talking with someone from the pro-life lobby one time, and they said, we want to overturn Roe. And I said, hey, we want to overturn Roe too. But we actually want to overturn the very concept of judicial supremacy, and every bill that you introduces, introduce just legitimizes Roe and makes the problem worse. And, makes, and, and, and legitimizes their, their judicial tyranny. And this person looked at me and just, yeah. Yep, it's true. This is but what I'm talking about right here is why people who get on board with abolition get excited by it. Because they're excited because we play by the rules. We play by the rules. Anytime you hear someone, a politician, or someone in the political establishment start talking about the rule of law, they are normally lying, okay? Whenever they have start using that phrase, just, you can almost 99.9% .9 of the time say, whatever they're doing, it must completely violate the actual rule of law. If they're the ones coming to you say like, hey, you need to respect the rule of law, they're the ones, I can almost guarantee you, who are trampling on the rule of law. And that's what we're really about, and that is the rule of law. And we're on the field, and we are getting yards, and we are forgetting as many as we can get at a time, even if it's just a few. And when the referees violate the rules, we're not gonna pay attention to their whistles and to their flags, and we're gonna keep marching down the field until we reach the end zone of righteous legislation by completely abolishing abortion, by providing equal protection for our pre-born neighbors. That's what we're gonna do. That's what we're gonna do. And along the way, we're not going to break the rules just to make the referees happy. We're not going to support bills that provide for unequal protection. We're not going to support policies that treat abortion like health care. 
We're not going to support legislation that's really just declarations of surrender. Because unlike football, where the rules say that the referees and the league office do have the last word in a game, our rule book says no such thing. And I'm talking about the Constitution. And of course, it is not the highest law in the land. God's law is the highest law of the land. But guess what? Both of them say that. Both the Constitution and God say the Supreme Court is not God. And that we do not have to submit to the tyranny. In fact, they say the opposite. The Constitution says that the Constitution and the laws made in pursuance thereof are the supreme law of the land. And the Tenth Amendment says that the powers not delegated to the federal government are left to the states and to the people. So the Constitution not only does not allow them to do what they're doing, it says the opposite. In fact, in this area, the Constitution actually says that the Supreme Court, they're not even the referee. They don't even have jurisdiction. They should, they should take off their pinstripe jersey because they're, it's like, it's, like, have you, you're, it's like playing a game and someone walks up and says, hey, I'm the referee here. Um, no, you're not. You have no jurisdiction over us outlawing murder. You have no jurisdiction here. Bradley, that is lawlessness what you're talking about. That's lawlessness. You want to talk about lawlessness? You're living in it. You're living in lawlessness. You're a fish swimming around in a sea of lawlessness. And you don't know what a lawful society actually looks like. Because we live in a lawless one on this issue. Lawlessness is a situation we have right now. Have you ever heard the phrase, a government of laws and not of men? John Adams said that. A lot of people said that. Well, you're not living in it. You're not living in it. There would be nothing at all lawless about abolishing abortion in this state. It would be debated and passed by a lawfully elected legislature. It would be enforced by a lawfully elected governor. It would be in compliance with the Constitution of this state and with the U.S. Constitution. It would be in compliance with the oaths which every legislator, governor, and official of this state have sworn oaths to a Constitution and not to a court. That's the oath that they have sworn. Now you tell me how abolishing abortion would not be lawful. It would be the most lawful thing that we have seen in our lifetimes for Oklahoma or any other state to abolish abortion. I'm not advocating lawlessness. I'm advocating a return to the law. Lex Rex, the law is king, not the courts. And the courts are subject to, not master of, that law. Not at all. I am not advocating lawlessness, God forbid. I advocate lawfulness, a return to the law, a recommitment to the law. The Constitution is the law, not the court's opinion of it. Stop saying that Roe versus Wade is the law of the land, for anyone who still says that. It's not the law of the land. The Constitution is the law of the land, not the court's twisting and perverting of it. We already said there's no constitutional protection for an abortion. Therefore, an opinion which says that there is, is not only unconstitutional, it's anti-constitutional. Not only is it anti-constitutional, it's evil. It's evil. Not only can we resist it, we must resist it, or else we're going to be the ones that go down in history as legitimizing tyranny. And I don't want to be that. Judicial supremacy, though, Bradley, the Supreme Court has the last word. Oh, I'm sorry, where is that in the rule book? I haven't seen that. It's not in there. Well, they told us they did. They told us they have the last word. And who are they? They only have the powers delegated them by the Constitution. If it doesn't say they do, then they don't. Now, they do have a role with judicial review. I have no pro issue with them reviewing government actions and determining whether or not they're consistent with the Constitution, where they have jurisdiction. But I do have a problem with the other two branches, the 50 states and the people taking a back seat 
and submitting to whatever the court decides, no matter how blatantly unconstitutional it is. But Bradley, but the court said, you're going to hear that. You're going to hear that at the Capitol. Well, the court said, the court said, Bradley, when people say that, they're the ones advocating lawlessness. They're the ones advocating lawlessness. Because when our founders set up this country, the reason why it was a beacon to the world was not because they concentrated power in the hands of the few. It was because they had a written constitution that limited the powers of the civil government. That was what was revolutionary. But that's a long time ago. We don't live in that society anymore. Not on this issue. Not on this issue. We live in we live in tyranny. Judicial supremacy is lawlessness by another name. It's saying that we have a government of men and not of laws. Listen, if the judiciary is supreme, we need to just change all the oaths of office that our legislators and governors and everybody, all of them swear when they stand up at the beginning of the session with their families and their smiling faces and they swear an oath. We just need to change what they're saying. Instead of swearing an oath to the Constitution, which they're ignoring, they just need to swear an oath to the courts. Because that's, that's who they're really going to, to know what they can and cannot do. We just need to change. Let's just say, be honest about it. Okay, you're going to do whatever the court says, then just swear an oath to them. Just do that. Maybe use that when you're at the Capitol this week. Use that one. Maybe not quite so loud, but, you know, graciously, graciously use that. Can we not agree that the court's power is not unlimited? That they are not omnipotent? That they are not God? That, is there not some line which if they cross it, we say no, no. And if this isn't the line, then what is? If this isn't line, the line for you, what is? You need to evaluate your priorities. Don't we have a line that if it were crossed, we would say no? Well, this is it. If not for the sake of the image of God being slaughtered by the millions, the most innocent among us, then what? Then what? Listen, I get discouraged when I hear people say, well, yeah, Bradley, but the court says, the court says that we have to do that. I get discouraged that the, the uh, spirit of Washington and Jefferson is dead. That the spirit of Moses to Pharaoh, that the spirit of Daniel to Darius, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, of the apostle Peter to the Sanhedrin is dead. Because that's not what they said. They didn't say, oh, you're the boss, I guess I have to do what you say. No, that's not what they said at all. Instead, the spirit of this age is far different, even in the church. Maybe even especially in the church that I see this. It's a spirit which says you cannot say no to the civil government. You cannot do that. That is wrong. Brothers and sisters, that's the same spirit which has given birth to and allowed the growth of every dictatorship and every genocide in human history. We should rebuke that spirit, not go along with it. Judicial supremacy is a myth. Thomas Jefferson said in her letter to William Jarvis, he said, you seem to consider the judges as the ultimate arbiters of all constitutional questions. A very dangerous doctrine indeed, and one which would place us under the despotism of an oligarchy. As we've already heard, the rule of a few, right? Well, that dangerous doctrine that Thomas Jefferson was rebuking in his letter, that doctrine is planted deep in the American mind today. We deeply believe in judicial supremacy. And you know what? The judiciary is supreme because we let them be. 
They are supreme because that's what is in our mind. That is what we have been indoctrinated in. That's what we have allowed in. They're not supreme because they have any real power. They're supreme because we let them be. They're supreme because we think that they are. And that's what we need to dispel in our minds and in the minds of others. Resistance to tyrants is obedience to God. Think about this. I want you to really think about this. In the 1850s, there were laws that prohibited people from helping a slave escape. Now think about this. To everyone listening, ask yourself, would you have been part of the Underground Railroad? Would you have been part of the Underground Railroad? Would you have been helping slaves escape even if it violated the law? Or would you be one who said, oh, we can't do that. We can't ignore the law, no matter how arbitrary, unlawful, and downright evil it is. Which would you be? Which would you be? We can't run all the plays. There's only two options, and you can't do both. You can ignore Roe, or you can appease evil. And let me show you what appeasing evil looks like. Almost every pro-life organization, every pro-life political organization that I've run into, opposes bills which completely abolishes abortion. That's actually how I even started, part of what got me into doing this, is a friend of mine was working at the Capitol and his boss, who was really wanted to end abortion, said, go talk to the pro-life organizations and ask them, if I just do a bill that outlaws abortion, would you support that? And my friend went and he talked to them. And then he came back and reported to me, to his boss first, and then to me, what they said. And you know what they said? They said, not only would we not support a bill that just completely outlawed abortion, we would oppose it. And that was a, that was a big turning point for me when I heard that. And when I saw that for myself very quickly. They oppose bills that abolish abortion. They even oppose bills oftentimes that take too many yards at a time. Because, well, we don't think the referees will allow us to take that many yards at a time. They oppose bills that take too big of an increment. In Ohio in 2016, they actually passed two bills. They passed a heartbeat bill and they passed a 20 week ban. And jo Governor John Kasich vetoed the heartbeat bill. You know why he did it? Because Ohio Right to Life asked him to. Ohio Right to Life, quoting from them, talking about both the heartbeat and the 20-week ban, quote, both are pre-viability bans, but we believe the 20-week ban is the best strategy for overturning Roe versus Wade and will ultimately prove most palatable to the Supreme Court. It's not just the Ohio strategy, but the national strategy directly from, in writing, an email of Ohio Right to Life. That's what they said. We need to make our bills what's most palatable to the Supreme Court. And the heartbeat bill, that's just too many yards at a time. Can't, can't go that far. You know what it's like, you know what it's called when you try to make your law most palatable to a decision we all call evil? That's called appeasing evil. That's called appeasing evil. And that's actually codified into some of our statutes in this country. In Arkansas, and I, I, getting to work on some abolition bills, I get to run into some of these statutes. And I'm always appalled when I do. It's like, wow, it really is this bad. We've actually put this into law. In Arkansas, quoting from 20-16-701 of their code, it is the intention of the General Assembly to regulate abortions in a manner consistent with the decisions of the United States Supreme Court. That's, in, that's the law. The law in Arkansas is we're going to regulate abortion in a manner consistent with the decisions of the United States Supreme Court. In Missouri, they have a, a law, 188.010, that says, it starts off really good, I want to read it to you. It says, in recognition that Almighty God is the author of life, and that all men and women are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, 
And that Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution of Missouri provides that all persons have a natural right to life. All right, so far so good. It's the intention of the General Assembly of the State of Missouri to, one, defend the right to life of all humans, born and unborn. Hey, that sounds good. Two, declare that the state and all of its political subdivisions, cities, counties, are a sanctuary of life that protects pregnant women and their unborn children. Okay, that's good. And three, regulate abortion to the full extent permitted by the Constitution of the United States, decisions of the United States Supreme Court, and federal statutes. Wait. You do know that's completely inconsistent with everything you said before, right? Yeah. You know what? When I first read that, and I was preparing a talk, I was like, that is one of the worst things I've ever seen. I would love to be part of, of, of a bill, of helping write a bill that got rid of that. Well, thankfully, there is a bill in Missouri today. <laughs> Representative Mike Moon has introduced a bill that specifically deals with that section, among many others. And where it says right now, regulate abortion to the full extent permitted by the Constitution of the United States, decisions of the United States Supreme Court, and federal statutes, it would, it would now just read, abolish abortion in this state. <laughs> of course, there's other language that gets more specific about that, about equal protection and everything like it. And Kansas has a law just like that as well. And you know what those do? They're actually putting into their laws that they consider what the Supreme Court says to be equal with what the Constitution says. That's like saying that a pastor, what he says, is equal to what the Bible says. Now, I'm grateful for pastors who faithfully interpret the Word of God. But the Word of God trumps everything that any pastor has ever said. And the Constitution is not the Word of God. Don't get me wrong. But the Constitution trumps everything that the Supreme Court has ever said. Okay? It's the law. That's what the law is. Appeasing evil is evil. Appeasing evil is, this is what it looks like. Dismemberment abortion bans. These have been passed in at least eight states last I checked, including one in Oklahoma in 2015. And listen to the, one of the authors of the bill, when he filed the bill, submitted a note, which you can go see in that state's um, legislative, not even history, in the actual filing. And it says, quote, under this bill, dismemberment may be used as long as the unborn child's heart has stopped beating prior to dismembering. You see, what, what you are led to believe and what you think when you hear about a dismemberment ban is that, oh, okay, well, yeah, I support stopping abortionists from ripping babies into parts. Yeah, I support that. I support that. But that's not what those bills do. Those bills say, oh, no, you can still rip babies into parts. They just had to be dead first. You just had to have a lethal injection first. You just have to cut the umbilical cord and let the baby asphyxiate. You just have to cut an artery and let the baby bleed out. Then you can rip them into parts. Does that just completely turn your stomach? It does mine. And in defending that bill, the attorney general of this state said the plaintiffs, which are the abortion clinics, have not presented any evidence in the record that the dismemberment ban would bar a single woman in this state from receiving an abortion. Not one. Wait, I thought we were trying to stop abortions. Not even one. Okay. Going on, quoting from the attorney general's um, assistant attorney general. The dismemberment ban is designed to do one thing and one thing only, and that is to end the particularly brutal, gruesome, and inhumane practice of killing a second trimester, essentially fully formed fetus, by tearing it apart limb from limb. This state has decided that these unborn children are entitled to more dignity. The dismemberment ban reflects the ethos of a humane and civilized society. The dismemberment ban would require one thing, a humane termination of an unborn child's life before it is dismembered and evacuated. That's all it does, end quote. 
that part that says that's all it does, that's, they said that. They said that. I, I can't really get behind that. Is that what we want? When we talk about running all the plays, is that what we want? Well, Bradley, I'm, I'm more for, for like, you know, early bands, like Heartbeat and things like that. All right, I'm about to make some even more people mad. You know, something happened in December just last year that everybody should know about. Everybody, sh I want you to know about it. And that is that the Federal Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals issued a ruling to strike down Mississippi's 15-week abortion ban. Because Mississippi passed a bill outlawing abortion after 15 weeks. And the reason that this is a big deal, of course, you know, it's kind of like, we're like, whatever, federal court not struck down pro-life bill, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that, that is my news feed. I mean, that's all the time. What's the big deal about this one? Well, it's because the Fifth Circuit is widely considered the most conservative appellate court, federal appellate court in the country. Okay? It's also the same court which is over Texas. The Texas Attorney General's Office filed a brief, 24 other states did, and yet all three judges ruling on the case unanimously struck it down this 15-week abortion ban passed by Mississippi lawmakers, signed by Mississippi governor. And the judges said why they're struck, striking it down. <laughs> they said, quote, in an unbroken line dating to Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court's abortion cases have established and affirmed and reaffirmed a woman's right to choose an abortion before viability. States may regulate abortion procedures prior to viability so long as they do not impose an undue burden on the woman's right, but they may not ban abortions, the law at issue is a ban. Thus, we affirm the district court's invalidation of the law." End quote. These are some of the most conservative federal appellate court judges in the country, and they just said, states may not ban abortions. Those are their words. Listen. The strategy of pro-life movement for the last 46 years is not working. It's not working. You just heard the Fifth Circuit, the most conservative appellate court in the country. They just struck down a 15-week ban. And there are people saying, well, let's do heartbeat bill. Another, another way to describe a heartbeat bill is an eight-week ban. Wait, the most conservative court in the country just struck down a 15-week ban, and you want to pass an eight-week ban? That, doesn't, that sounds insane. Why are we doing that? I don't know everybody's motives for why they do what they do, and I don't want to ascribe motives to everybody. But here's something that I do see politicians love to do. In fact, if you take a politician's 101 class, they teach you this on day one. Here's how to be a politician, 101. You ready? Doing stuff makes people mad. But not doing stuff also makes people mad. So the way to keep from making people mad is to look like you're doing something without actually doing anything. Okay? That's politics 101. And you're, now that, if you haven't heard that before, now that you've heard it, you're going to see it everywhere. You're like, why are they doing that bill? Why are they doing a Born Alive Infant Protection Act? It's already illegal to kill people after they're born. Because you need to look like you're doing something that doesn't actually do anything. That's why you need to do that. Wait, why are we going to pass a heartbeat bill? They already struck down a 15-week ban. We're going to do an eight-week ban? Yeah, but at least we'll look like we're doing something. And then when they strike it down, it won't actually do anything. Woo! And we can raise money on that. And we can blame them. The, well, in those courts, ah, oh, man. One day, just keep voting Republican one day. One day. Listen, we can pass all the regulations and limited bans in the world, but if the courts are just going to strike them down, and we're just going to surrender when they do, then what are we really accomplishing? Except that we are further legitimizing the judicial tyranny that we keep complaining about. 
If we don't like the beast, then stop feeding it. When we appease evil, what do we get? More evil. It's time to stop compromising on this very foundation of American liberty, of Christian ethics, the right to life. Stop appeasing evil. Stop legitimizing tyranny. Stand on the Constitution, trust God, and demand the total abolition of abortion without compromise. There's really three methods that we see when it comes to people who really want to end abortion. And we see the pro-life incrementalism, which is comply with Roe and other Supreme Court opinions while taking all the ground or all the yards that the Supreme Court will let us have. That's, that's the pro-life, um, that's the playbook. There's also, you've probably heard of personhood. I have lots of people I love that have been involved in personhood. But the same issue applies here. Because the personhood strategy, as I see it, has been also to comply with Roe and other Supreme Court opinions while identifying a weakness in the Roe decision. So we pass state statutes, state constitutional amendments, federal statutes, federal constitutional amendments to exploit the perceived weakness. Why? So that the court will recognize that the 14th Amendment definition of person includes preborn persons and the court will reverse itself and overturn Roe. If anybody, if I'm misstating that, please correct me. Please correct me. I, I certainly want to be fair. Both of those issues, both of those messages fail to dish, deal with the issue that the referees are acting in a tyrannical manner. And going back to those referees again and again and again is not the answer. The problem is not the text of the Constitution. The problem is not the rules. The problem is that we're letting the referees get away with ignoring the rules. The federal courts are not the solution to the problem. They are the problem. And abolition takes that head on. Abolition continues in the legacy of our founding fathers and says, we stand for the rights of Englishmen. We stand for the rights of Americans. We stand for the rights of every human being who's endowed by their creator with those rights. Abolition treats Roe as a legal nullity. It's of no effect because it's unconstitutional. It's outside the jurisdiction of the court. And so we pass laws abolishing abortion by providing you equal protection. That's abolition. So when people say run all the plays, first of all, what do they mean by that? If they mean, oh, let's do the 20 week bans, the PRINDA, which is Prenatal Non-Discrimination Act, the heartbeat bills, the 15 week bans, the let's, let's just act like abortion is just a bad medical ethics decision and, and take away their license to practice medicine. When they wanna do those things and run all the plays, you can't do that and also support abolition. They're mutually exclusive. You cannot stand up to the tyrant and bow down to the tyrant at the same time. Hello. But there is something that we should be doing at the same time, and that is while seeking to pass bills of abolition, we should want the Supreme Court to overturn Roe, right? They should overturn Roe. It's an evil decision. They should overturn it. That would be wonderful if they overturned it. But you know what's most likely to get them to overturn it? It's not by bowing at their feet, it's by standing up to them. It's by saying, no, you gotta follow the rules or we're gonna just gonna keep, we're gonna do it. It's by ignoring the court, by the states holding them accountable. Because if the court knows that the states are going to ignore it and that the other two branches are not going to back it up, I believe the court's gonna fold. They're gonna say, oh, okay, well, we'll just overturn it ourselves because otherwise we're gonna look like a paper tiger because we don't have any real power. And the moment a state gets away with ignoring something we said is the moment that our power is gone. And so to prevent its own virtual impotence from being exposed, the court would have a strong incentive 
strong incentive to overturn Roe itself. So we should want to overturn Roe, but you don't overturn it the way we've been doing it for 47 years. The way you do it is by following the true rule of law and abolishing abortion and not waiting for them to do the right thing, doing it now. Listen, abolition and the strategy of the pro-life lobby are incompatible. You cannot run all the plays. They're as different as night and day. The strategy of the pro-life lobby appeases tyranny. The strategy of abolition opposes tyranny. You can't appease tyranny and oppose tyranny at the same time. You cannot run all the plays. There are only two paths, and you can't be on both. Abolition or incrementalism. Follow the rules or follow the referees. And if, me, and if running all the plays means supporting incre incrementalism, then it's opposition to abolition. And that's why you hear people referred to as anti-abolition. Anti-abolition. And I want everybody hearing this to choose, to choose one or the other. Either appease tyranny or oppose it. I choose to oppose tyranny. I choose abolition. Thank you.